disclose myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You heard that I said to you, I will go away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now I have told you before it happens, so that when it happens you may believe. I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me. But so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up, let us go from here. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, so that it may, may bore, bore more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I am you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. I gather them, cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. The uh, Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciple. Now our confession. I confess to Almighty God, to my fellow believers, and to all my neighbors, that I have sinned greatly in thought, word, and deed by my own desire, consent, and fault. Therefore, I beg the God of undeserved grace to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God has had mercy upon you, has forgiven all your sins, and saved you. He will deliver you from the evil one, confirm you in every good work, and lead you to life eternal. Amen. And now we're opening it.
continue with our order of vespers for this evening. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. O Lord, open thou my lips. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. be seated. Our psalm portion for this evening is Psalm 43, the first five verses. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my case against an ungodly nation. For you are the God of my strength. Why have you rejected me? O oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? And why are you disturbed within me? Our lesson continues our reading through Luke's account of the Sermon on the Plain. we now in uh, chapter 6, beginning at verse 20. And turning his gaze toward his disciples, he began to say, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and ostracize you, and insult you, and scorn your name as evil, for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophet. But woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophet in the same way. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. We continue with the next hymn.
Grace, peace, mercy, and the truth of Christ your Lord be and abide with you all. We continue our study of the Sermon on the Plain in Luke chapter 6. Congregation may be seated. We are now to that portion of Christ's sermon, which I believe he gave often, and a portion at the beginning of his sermon, probably whenever he did, was a series of blessings and woes. Sometimes he gave only blessings, sometimes only woes. Here in Luke's account, he does both. And they are paired up very nicely, four and four. We're going to concentrate this evening on the first four, that is the blessings. Especially as they apply to us in our day to day. Now you may have heard me say from time to time over the years, when talking about this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain, either one, uh, you may have heard me say there is no gospel in the sermon. What I should have said, what I always should say, is that the sermon proper after the introduction, after the Beatitudes. Certainly, the rest of the sermon is mostly law and given for a very good reason, so that people can see what is God demands of them and understand how much they need a Savior. And especially this was true of the scribes and Pharisees and others of the Jewish leaders who were following Jesus from the very earliest days of his ministry and would hear each of these sermons. And so Jesus was preaching at them also, principally to try and drive them to faith, which he obviously succeeded because the book of Acts tells us that a number of Pharisees, quite a number of Pharisees, many Pharisees, actually joined the Christian congregation in Jerusalem. But here in the introduction, if you will, to the sermon, and in this blessing portion, in this uh, four blessings that God uh, gives, that Jesus gives uh, from his Father, um, is some important truths for us to consider during this Lenten season. Notice, first of all, that he turns his gaze toward his disciples. We know that these two sermons, both the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain, were delivered directly to the disciples, even though we know also, as I mentioned, many other people, including the enemies of Jesus, were listening in. But Jesus was teaching specifically disciples, specifically those who had chosen to follow him. This would mean the 12. This would also later on in the ministry mean 70 others. Later on, towards the end of his ministry, 120 who were full-blown disciples. That is, they left everything and followed Jesus. 120 of them. So he's talking to those who had, if you will, by the work of the Holy Spirit, made the commitment to put Jesus Christ and his word first in their lives. That's you. You are sitting here this evening. You are believers by that same power of the Holy Spirit. You are believers because of baptism, because God has used His Word and His sacraments to create saving faith in your heart, to bring you into His family and make you His child. And so you are a disciple. You are a follower. You are a learner. You are a listener. You listen to God when he speaks. And as much as God gives you the power and ability, you do his will. So that's who Jesus is talking to. He's talking directly to you right now, here tonight. Blessed are you who are poor. For yours is, please note the verb there, is, not will be, not might be, not can be, not should be, not ought to be, but yours is, right now, right now. Yours is the kingdom of God. You are, right now, in the kingdom of God already. 
It doesn't seem that way because we're still alive. It doesn't seem that way because our old Adam still attacks us and still causes us to fall into sin, sometimes very willful sin. We know what we're not supposed to do, we do it anyway. We know what we are supposed to do, and we fail to do it. But we are still, sin, sinners though we are, we are in, right now, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is here. As Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst of them. And so Jesus is here, and we know that wherever Jesus is, the Father is. And we know wherever the Father is, is also the Spirit, and therefore the Holy Trinity exists right here in this room tonight. And this is the kingdom of God. The word poor is very weak here. I don't know why uh, translators continue to use this word. I, I guess because the word poor, you know, it kind of uh, maybe tugs at our heartstrings a little bit when we think of those who are uh, kind of less privileged than we, and so on and so forth, and we think of those on the streets and so on and so forth. But, but really, that's not the word in Greek. The word in Greek is much more complicated than that. It's um, a beggar, but, but not even a beggar. Uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beggar who is a slovenly beggar. That is, it's a beggar who has less than nothing. It, it's a beggar like that Zacharias uh, at the gates of the rich man, you know, with nothing but the dogs to keep him company, to lick his sores. And he has no bag uh, to carry along with him. Uh, you know, he, he's, he's, a, he's a beggar, like, like the beggar at the temple who was healed by, by uh, John and, uh, and uh, 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 Peter. Uh, you know, he had nothing. He, he just was catching uh, alms in his cloak. Uh, these, these people, you know, when we think of poor today, we, we think of the street people, we think of the homeless, but have you ever, have you ever looked at those people? I, I, I looked at some today. It kind of irritated me a little bit because they crossed right in the middle of the street and, and just about got hit by a car. And, and I thought to myself, you, haven't ever, you ever heard of a crosswalk? It's not that far away. It was only 50 feet down the road. There's a crosswalk. You could have crossed there. But I noticed what they had. They had both the, had a wagon, and in the wagon was piled high with stuff, and, and, a, and a stroller, and in the baby stroller was piled high with stuff, and a bicycle, and a dog, uh, and the guy was talking on his cell phone. You know, and, 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 and I thought, you know, think about the beggars. If you, if you ever read anything or, or seen a movie depicting the Middle Ages, you know, like maybe the old movie The Prince and the Pauper, you know, how, the, how that kid lived before he changed places, you know, with the prince. Uh, prince that's supposed to be Prince Edward. <clears throat> and, and, uh, or, or, or think of the beggars again, as I say, in Jesus' day. Like these people had absolutely nothing. Nothing. They were dirty, uh, uh, slovenly, uh, they crawled on the ground. They ate dirt all their lives. They had nothing. See, that's, that's what this word means. It, it, and, and, they, and they knew it. And, and when they begged, they begged in humility. Not pride. They didn't say, oh, uh, I've been, I've been uh, picked on or, or uh, I, I've had bad luck. Or, or what? No, they, 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 they said, "Oh, I am, I am a miserable person. Have pity on me." It's too bad that this does not come out in the Bible translations of our day. It's too bad because this is really what Jesus is talking about. If you are a disciple, you come to God with nothing. You come to God bare naked with your sins oozing out of you like so much pus. We come to God in humility. You know, one of the big things lacking in the Christian church today is humility. People don't have any humility. People want to do all kinds of glorious things. And people want to have all their rights. And they want to have all their privileges, even in the church. 
You don't see people today coming before God, coming in here kneeling or prostrating themselves. You know how many centuries that's the way Christians began their worship? So when you hear Jesus say, blessed are the poor, I want you to remember always, he's saying, blessed are the crawling beggars who come to God in abject, miserable humility, realizing that they are but slugs before an almighty creator. But Jesus says they're blessed. And they're blessed because, again, they're members of that kingdom. He goes on to say, you are hungry now. What kind of hunger is this? It's not worldly hunger. It's spiritual hungry. What are you hungry for? You're hungry for righteousness, as he says in Sermon on the Mount. You're hungry for holiness. You're hungry. What do you want to see? When you turn on the TV, when you open the newspaper, what would you love to see? Wouldn't you love to see peace? Wouldn't you love to see righteousness? Wouldn't you love to see charity and hope and mercy and grace? Isn't that what you would love to see? Of course you would. You're hungry. You're hungry for more people in God's world living according to His will. You're hungry for the wonder and the amazing greatness of God's kingdom to be around us all the time, even here in this sinful world. That's what we're hungry for. And what does he say? This it, and, and, and yeah, again, here again, oh, our translators really mess up. Uh, it says, you shall be satisfied. Well, they're thinking of, well, you're hungry now and later you'll be full of food. No! No, you're, you're, you're hungry for righteousness. You are, it says. The Greek says, you are satisfied. It's present tense. It's, you are satisfied. Why are you satisfied? Because of this. Because of this, because of what goes on over there, because of this, because of that. That's how you are satisfied. You want righteousness? Come in this building. You want righteousness? Open this book. You want righteousness? Go to God in prayer. You want righteousness? Receive his supper. You want righteousness? Remember your baptism. You, you have righteousness all around you. All the time. That's why, that's why it says, you are satisfied. Not you will be someday. You are right now. You can be. If you realize it. It's the same with the next thing. Blessed are you who weep now. Not you shall laugh. You are laughing. You laugh now. We can laugh now. We can look at the terrors of the world and we can laugh right now. I mentioned to the Bible class on Tuesday. There's no way for Mr. Putin to win this war. There's no way, numerically speaking. Soldier speaking. Troop speaking. There's no way. To occupy Ukraine, to control it, to subdue it, would take 800,000 troops. You look it up. Look it up. Look up under military doctrine. Look up. What, how many troops it takes to subdue a population? It takes one soldier that's on the ground, not flying up in the air, pushing buttons. Okay? One soldier for 50 civilians. There are 40 million people in Ukraine. 40 million. There's no way he can win, except he does one thing. Pushes the big red button. Or gasses people, or unleashes a plague. And if he does that, we just heard today, that's the red line. What one senator said, that's the red line. He crosses that line, chemical, biological, nuclear, he crosses that line. <laughs> Take him on. You know what? You don't got to be scared, you don't have to be afraid. You can laugh. 
That's what it says right there. You can laugh. Because you know Jesus will come over the hill and put an end to the whole shooting match. <laughs> They'll put an end to everything, including Mr. Putin. Yeah, you know that. That's not going to allow puny, rotten, stinking human beings to destroy his world. He has said very clearly that's up to him. He destroys. Yeah, God alone is the destroyer. He, he reserves that privilege for himself. And of course we know that when Jesus comes over the hill, we are instantly glorified and welcomed into heaven. Ha! So, laugh away, my friends. Laugh away. He goes on. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you. Here the word means excommunicate. Throw you out of the church of the day. What does it tell you about the church of the day? What does it tell you about the majority church in our world? If you, the lovers of the Son of Man, the lovers of Jesus Christ and His Word, are excommunicated, what does that tell you? It tells you that the church has turned has turned, just like the church of Jesus' day, just like the scribes and Pharisees, just like the Sadducees and the priests, just like all the Levites, just like all of those other people, they turned on God and killed His Son. Do you think for one minute there's a difference between the church of Jesus' day and the church of our day? When homosexual pastors take a pulpit? Do you think there's any, any semblance of righteousness in a church that proclaims evolution as the reason how you got here? You tell me that the church has not then turned itself and turned itself right on Jesus himself? Of course. And you should expect, you should look forward to the day when you're excommunicated because you say there are only two genders, male and female. It'll happen. Give it time. It'll happen. We shouldn't be shocked and surprised. Jesus, as a matter of fact, says we should be blessed. Blessed are you who stick to the Word when even the visible church turns against it. Be glad in that day. That's today. Be glad in your life right now and leap for joy. I loved what one uh, commentator uh, put as this word. Gambled. G-A-M-B-O-L. When's the last time you heard that word, gambled? Boy, I hadn't heard that word since maybe I was knee-deep to a grasshopper. Uh, gambled. What does gambled mean? Gambled means like the gymnasts do. To somersault twirl and jump. That's what that Greek word means. It meant somebody who is so ecstatic, who is so happy that they can't even stand on their feet. They've got to jump around and they've got to do somersaults even if they're 80 years old. They gambled. That's what it says. Gamble in this day. Now, I don't want to go out, anybody go out there and bust your knee up, okay? So don't do that. But why? Because it says your reward, and again, note, this time they get it right, your reward is, right now, great in heaven. Or in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. Just as the prophets are now in heaven, at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, at right now with Jesus Christ, uh, and ruling with him, just right now, as those prophets wear crowns of glory right now, so also we wear crowns of glory in God's eyes right now. We are right now in that heavenly place. Our reward is, note that, is great in heaven. My dear Christian friends, this is wonderful blessing. And wonderful blessing given to us who are scorned and ostracized and insulted and called evil. 
I tell you this evening, look upon those things as badges of honor. Look upon those things as medals. Better than any silver star or bronze star or medal of honor. They are indeed the fruit salad on your chest. They are indeed your glory because they are first and foremost God's glory. So, enjoy heaven. You've got a piece of it now. You get the whole thing soon enough. And now the peace of God that goes beyond all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in true faith through Christ Jesus, your Lord. Amen. <clears throat> we continue the top portion of page six. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. You may be seated for prayer. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, your goodness is showered down upon us every day. With deep humility, we acknowledge our many sins and infirmities which duly offend you. Lord, you are infinite in mercy, and so pardon the sins which we have committed through negligence, weakness, frailty, whether in thought, word, or deed, and grant that they may never again rise up against us. Urge our hearts from all evil passions and desires, from envy, hatred, and malice, and preserve us pure and blameless, empty of offense toward you and of all people. Bless us with all bodily and spiritual blessings and a grateful sense of your kindness. Give us a knowledge of your will and a desire to perform it. Grant us always the sure and joyful hope of everlasting life. Let the light of your gospel shine on all nations and be gracious to our own land. Bless all who are in authority over us, that righteousness and peace may everywhere prevail. Help the needy and oppressed. Restore the sick, comfort the dying, and sanctify the disciples of your disciplines of your hand to all who endure them. We commit ourselves to your almighty protection for the coming night. May our thoughts be pure and devout when we lie down, and when we awake, may we still be with you. O God, who neither slumbers nor sleeps, be the comfort and strength of our hearts and our great reward forever. All through the abounding mercy of Jesus Christ, our Lord, have mercy upon us and hear our prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. 
The Lord will give strength to His people. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come unto us, give now unto your servants that peace which this world cannot give, so that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and that we, being defended by you from the fear of our enemies, might pass our time here in rest and quietness only through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, lives and reigns with you and the Holy Ghost, one God, forever and ever. Bless we the Lord. The grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Please join now in the closing hymn. Please be seated. Very good evening to everyone once again. Glad you survived the unannounced wind. Nothing in the forecast about wind. How do they do that? If I, if I was that bad, I would get fired. Anyway, uh, I was remiss. I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, whoever the person was who put the numbers on the hymn board, I guess that was me. Um, forgot to put the verses down for the first hymn. You may have noticed that that hymn, we're going to be singing that hymn first the whole way, every Wednesday, okay? Because it's a long hymn, and so I never pick it. I thought about that. I looked at it, I said, I never picked this hymn. Why? Right, because it's got, you know, 10, 12, whatever verses. I thought, well, we'll just break it up. We'll sing three verses every Wednesday, and that way we'll cover the whole thing. Well, I forgot to mention that. I'll try to remember it next week <laughs> to put the, put the verse numbers on there, Okay. So anyway, there is a service next week, uh, Sunday or Wednesday, same time, seven o'clock. Uh, this weekend schedule remains the same. Uh, so I'll see you in uh, Bible class and/or uh, worship or both uh, on Sunday. 
Thank you and good evening.